we do not want to condone or celebrate disorder or weirdness for the sake of being weird, but at the same time, I do not want to stifle or quench the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I believe God is and is ready to pour out His Spirit without measure. My question is, are we trying to give God terms to work with? Often, cessationism is birthed out of experiential theology yeah. mixed with offense. Lord gave me a word, if you want to step into revival, if the church wants to experience the full move of the Spirit, mm. then you actually need to be willing to pay the price mm. for what, you know, in the 1900s, with the advent of Pentecostalism, 1906, you had the Azusa Street Revival. Um, we have seen, unfortunately, in the last 20 years, even charismatic Pentecostal churches um, get a little bit light about the Holy right. Spirit, mm. or even apologetic about the Holy yeah. Spirit. And the Lord said, I want to reintroduce my church to Pentecostal fire. And that was the genesis behind yeah. that book. So is it a lot of teaching, stories, combination it's, of both? It's, it's a bit of an interesting hybrid. It is teaching, it is stories, it's revival history. I even have a whole chapter called Who Unplugged the Power Ooh. about the lie of cessationism. <laughs> That's good. Um, because the bottom line is nobody, like God did not unplug his power. Yeah. It's what we ended up believing about the Holy Spirit that disconnected us from a flow of his presence and power that's been with us since the day of Pentecost. So, so like when you write something like that, obviously to me, I look at a book, okay, here's the book. All right, here's yeah. the outline of the book. You're touching on what, three or four different topics in one book? How are you able to kind of like hone in on each piece and give it enough attention yeah. to fit in the book? And to make it actually make sense and right. keep it organized. Well, the, the great grand theme of it was Pentecostal fire, restoring mm -hmm. the church really to the model that we see in the book of Acts. So yeah. everything falls under that. So all the stories, all of the history, even the chapter on cessationism and this belief that the Holy Spirit doesn't move or demonstrate himself with that power anymore, mm -hmm. it all falls under that headline that, hey, when did God ever change the blueprint for the church? Mm -hmm. when, when did God ever say, you know what, you need to actually improve upon what we saw the day of Pentecost mm -hmm. and in the book of Acts. So everything kind of flowed under that headline of going back to that Pentecostal fire that marked the early church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you were saying that cessationism. How did you how did you word that again? Because I wanted to, I wanted to just touch on that a tad. You were talking about oh goodness. Uh, you were saying I, I'm that sure cessation. It was good. No, I, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I talked was about, that the working definition you used in the book? Is what I'm asking uh, for most, cessationism. Most likely, mo most likely, yeah. because again, there there is this even concept. And people, maybe your everyday believer would not use the word cessationism, mm -hmm. but there's this erroneous idea as if God unplugged His power from the church to where wow. it's like, well, you know what? There's power to save and to redeem people. Praise God for that. Mm -hmm. And there's a measure of power that people will see in prayer. And we were talking about this earlier, David, to where there is even a concept where if I pray a desperate, maybe frantic prayer for healing, God may be, if he's feeling good that day, My will answer. heal somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But um, the doctrine, well, I wouldn't even call it doctrine, the erroneous teaching of cessationism basically says, uh, God does not continue to move through unusual signs, wonders, miracles. That which was standard in the book of Acts should no longer be expected or anticipated as standard today. Yeah. And my theologically robust response to that is, where does Scripture tell us that we should change our expectation? Oh, mm, that's that's so my good. question. Where does Jesus, obviously Jesus doesn't say anything. Apostle Paul, New, New Testament epistles, none of them tell us to, uh, to to change our perspective. If anything, they tell us the opposite. It's funny because the reason I wanted to ask about the definition is whenever you try mm -hmm. to define cessationism, typically, not all the time, you'll probably be accused of misrepresenting what the belief actually says. Sure. So if you say, well, you don't believe in healing anymore, they'll say, well, we believe in healing. Mm -hmm. We just don't believe that men can wield it as they did in the New, in Testament, the New Testament, Testament or in the Old Testament, yes. right? There's kind of this moving of the goalposts. And what's interesting is, for example, on the topic of healing, we don't believe that men ever wielded it on their own anyway. No, right. No, uh, right. We, we truly believe that the sovereignty of God applies to the miraculous as well. But I think it actually comes down to, and, and most who claim cessationism would disagree. And by the way, like we're not against cessationists, the believer. I'm against cessationism, the doctrine. Yes. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to demonize someone. I'm not going to say, oh, you're not a Christian. Or, 
Oh my you, goodness. You, there's, no. there's, I have friends who are cessationists. They love Jesus and they're, they're born again. I think they're wrong on, on that doctrine, but we still get along just fine. But can Believe I say it or that, not. Well, Believe well, it or not. I do. But this is important to note because mm. I would say that there are hard cessationists and there are soft cessationists. Mm -hmm. Hard cessationists would actually create cessationism and use it as a barrier for fellowship. So you're talking about mm, how you wow. have friends who are cessationists. Very good friends. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you know what? I'll be honest. There are theologians and pastors and teachers who are cessationists that I actually drink very deeply from their teaching. So we honor them. But so there's that's there's soft cessationists where that's like, well, we believe God still heals and God still, but, but it's not expected as a common occurrence. But hard cessationism that that creates a little bit of even a spirit or an attitude on those people mm, right. to where they would renounce or denounce us as hellbound heretics. Wow. Yeah, that's, and that's concerning. Like yeah, our, that's a bit emotional for like me. Almost like it's our way, right? Or the highway, like you're done. Whatever. Correct. If you're not believing how we believe in cessationism, you got it wrong. Yeah. That's and crazy. I think ironically, the people who claim that we're emotional react very emotionally to the topic. I mean, it's not really a, na it's not really a rational approach. No. It's a very angry, and anger is an emotion. It's a very angry, reactive, defensive yeah, yeah. response. Can, can, I, can I say this? This is fun. This yeah. is because, you know, what we're trying to do, we're trying to process this because right. often cessationism is birthed out of experiential theology yep. mixed with offense. The Encounter podcast is brought to you in part by Numa Streaming. It's about time the kingdom of God had its own streaming platform. Numa features preachers and teachers of the word, and best of all, Numa does not censor them for sharing biblical truth. Numa is growing fast and currently features creators like David Diga Hernandez, Vlad Savchuk, Spencer Nakamura, and more. You can watch Numa streaming for free using their website or one of their apps. Additionally, a portion of all Numa profit goes to support Christian ministries, the future of Christian media is here. Start watching for free now by visiting streamnuma.com. That's S-T-R-E-A-M-N-U-M-A.com. We're trying to do, we're trying to process this because right. often cessationism is birthed out of experiential theology yep. mixed with offense. Mm, wow. Experiential mm. theology. What does that mean? It means... I prayed for somebody to get healed. Usually it's a family member. Usually it's somebody very close. Prayed for them to be healed and they died. Or this mm. perception, God let me down. I understand that. Like God doesn't want us to run up to people like that. And be like, oh, brother, uh, that person didn't get healed because they didn't have enough faith. Like those, those responses have been very shoddy responses coming from the charismatic stream to the people like that. So I get it. But we cannot create a theology based on our experience. Yeah. I.e., I prayed for somebody, they didn't get healed. That means God is not the healer. Can I say it this way? Um, I don't have a theology that God heals. I don't believe that God heals because of my experience being healed or seeing other people healed. I don't believe that he is the healer because I have seen or experienced yeah. a healing. I believe he is the healer that there are gifts of the Spirit available today and that there are demonstrations of power that he wants to release not because of experience, but because of the Word of God. Have you ever heard of the objective believer? No. You would love his channel. Oh. Okay, so <laughs> Good channel. I, I love Deji, it. You know who he is, right? <laughs> right, right, right. De Deji yeah. and I have watched him. You've watched some mm -hmm. of his clips. No, he's real good. He's brilliant. And he, um, he has a channel, and he's a charismatic Christian who approaches the topics very philosophically and logically. Mm -hmm. Oh, come on. So he presents these very robust arguments, and I find his theology, his doctrine, very grounded, very level-headed. Yes. And then I contrast that with this kind of like, you're mocking God and you're a blasphemer. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's almost yeah, like yeah, the yeah, more yeah. dramatic they are, the think, they think the more, um, more believable they are. But it's like, it's interesting because he, he, he brought up that very point in one of his videos where, and, and again, this is not to say that that is necessarily always an accurate representation of how a cessationist thinks, but very yeah. often though they wouldn't verbalize it that way and though they're not probably consciously aware of it, it is in fact based yeah. on experience rather than what the word actually teaches. And so I think that that was interesting. So he pointed that out about, um, about healing, yes. about the prophetic. And even when he was talking about some of the modern day prophets, how, you know, yeah, there's prophets today who, you know, they absolutely miss it. And that needs to be, that needs to be dealt with. We, we got to make sure we're, <laughs> yeah. We're, yeah. we're, 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 we're confronting Point what needs to be confronted. That's not something that you, you just, you know, wink your eye and say, it's okay, no, no problem. That, that's, that's a big deal. 
Um, but, you know, he was talking about the fact that, if I'm even quoting him correctly, that just because we're not necessarily seeing it the way we want to yeah. doesn't mean that it's not available because we, we no. look at the word. What does the word yeah. say? Yeah. And then you work out from there. But on that point of cessationism, I found that there's this, this common thread, whether they are, as you would say, a soft cessationist yeah. or a hard cessationist. I think there's this common thread of believing in God's power in theory, mm. but never practice. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And so... Yeah. However you want to define cessationism, sure. however extreme you want to be about it, whatever side of it you're on, hard, soft, or somewhere in between, it always comes down to, yeah, in theory, because that's the defense, right? Well, we do believe in healing, mm-hmm. but we do believe God speaks, you know, and the, the, yes. you know, they talk about the sufficiency of scripture as if the scripture wasn't sufficient enough to connect me with the God who still speaks. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But, you know, then there are other issues like prophecy and so forth. And so that basically is a criticism now against any practice of it. Mm-hmm. If it's not absolute, absolutely perfect, at least in their minds, the practice of it in any way, that gets criticized. It has to be. And I've never seen like an example of where they bring up a healing and say, now this is an example of what I think is proper healing, or this is an example right, of what right. I believe is a proper sure. deliverance. It, anything that is actually in practice is criticized. It's only ever acceptable in theory. Mm, mm. Well, what's interesting as you're talking about that, in terms of even what God is doing right now in the earth, and I believe his activity is only increasing, there is something about the practice. There's something about the demonstration of the Holy Mm. Spirit. Why does it bring out critics and controversy? Because the practice, the demonstration is messy. It is messy, and Mm. it does confront their theological ideals. Often what happens, it's almost like this ivory tower perspective. It's like, well, in my mind, this is what it's supposed to look like. Oh, and it's violating my idea of what I expect expect, God should do. Ultimately, we're putting God in a box. I, I think, and we'll talk about this more, in order for us to step into the fullness of what God wants to do in the days ahead, um, he is ready to pour out his spirit without measure. I believe that. I believe God is and is ready to pour out his spirit without measure. My question is, are we trying to give God terms to work with? Mm. Yeah. And the pushback on that, though, would be, well, there has to be order. It has to be according decently to Scripture. Decently in an order. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 1 Corinthians fourteen forty. Let all things be done decently in order. That would be the pushback. But you're not saying, hey, we're all for the disorder. Hey, we're all for the mess. You're saying that God working through humans who are fallible, yeah. who mm-hmm. make mistakes, that's not always going to look like you imagine it to look. Well, I was going to say, actually, I'm all for disorder. Like, oh. I, I, it's just like <laughs> people accuse me of swinging from the chandelier. Hey, if there's a chandelier. No, no, I'm kidding. It's interesting. <laughs> First Corinthians 14, 40. We got to laugh about this yeah. stuff. Um, you know, I spent five years getting my degree, my master's of divinity, church history and renewal at Regent University. I, I did that because I felt like the Lord said, I want you to be like the apostle Peter for the days ahead. I'm like, well, what does that mean? And he's like, I want you to be what he was on the day of Pentecost, where mm. when the Holy Spirit came with such unusual power and manifestation, and it looked disorderly from a natural eye, because what did you have on Acts chapter two, day of Pentecost? Mighty rushing wind, in tongues of fire, peering over the people. You had them speaking in unusual languages. You had 3,000 yeah. people coming to see and hear this sight. You had unusual manifestations of the Holy Spirit happening. And what Peter did is in the middle of the manifestation, in the middle of what people would per- probably perceive to be crazy, Peter got up and biblically said, hey, this is that which was which spoken was about by yeah. the prophet Joel. He gave a biblical basis for what the Spirit of God was doing. I'm so grateful, let me just say it this way, that Peter was not like the modern Pharisee of the yeah. 21st century because mm. what happens often is the Holy Spirit will move. He'll move in power. It'll get messy. Unusual things will start happening. We can just go right there. People will experience the presence of God. They'll shake. They'll tremble. They'll fall. They'll laugh. They'll cry. That kind of thing will happen. And then you'll have a few vocal critics. I say a few right. because the majority of people, David, you see it in your meetings, are 
hungry for God. Mm. The majority of people who don't even know Jesus, there's this lie, well, we don't want to have the Holy Spirit doing all that unusual stuff in our meeting because we don't want to offend people. I can tell you this, if people are coming into our meetings who do not know the Lord, they do not know Jesus, and they're actually coming and they're crossing the threshold of our churches, they're coming into those meetings hungry for something supernatural. They are hungry to see, is this God real? And we have a responsibility to introduce them to Holy Spirit, who is the demonstration, the confirmation that Jesus died, rose again, seated at the Father's right hand, and Jesus got everything he paid for and everything he prayed for, and he prayed Mm, for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So my bottom line is there, I feel an assignment that in the days ahead, as the Spirit moves unusually, which we will see him do, I want to be able to get up and say, hey, actually, this is that which was prophesied by Joel. We are stepping into the last day's revival. Will it be unusual? Yes, but it will be God. Well, the supernatural by definition is unusual. It's weird. Anytime God interacts with humanity, it's going to be unusual. That is outside of the realm of what you've imagined it to be or inconsistent with what you've limited it to be. Mm. Um, On that note, you know, it's interesting because you're talking about this strangeness. (laughs) Now, I know I'm a little strange. It's just something I've accepted. And, you know, I used to tell people, I still do, you know, you're so worried when you start praying in tongues that everyone's going to think you're strange. Well, I have news for you. They absolutely will think you're strange, right? But who cares? And that's, you know, this idea, it's such a, that idea itself is strange that because of the strangeness of the supernatural that we are somehow bringing, quote, reproach, another dramatic word, you know, the more dramatic, the more right you are, remember, Uh, you know, reproach upon the name of Christ or shame to the gospel, right? That's kind of the way it's framed. And you look at the New Testament and you see the exact opposite of that type of mindset. You know, when you say things like that, you're being inconsistent with what even Jesus said. Mm. Jesus told us why the world doesn't believe. Right. Yeah. Look, I understand. We don't want to add strangeness for the sake of strangeness itself. Mm, absolutely. We don't want to be weird just to be weird, but we do want to embrace what God has given to us. And in yeah. so embracing what God has given to us, that's going to appear strange to the world. Yes. Yes. In John three, Jesus talks about the fact that this is the verdict. Light has come into mm. this dark world, the people rejected it. Why? Because they love darkness. Because they love darkness. <laughs> yeah, they love darkness. Are, are we really mm. supposed to believe that a world that believes all the strange things that it does, and this is by no means a justification of the strange things they believe, but all of those strange things that are absolutely blatantly unbiblical, are we really supposed to believe that they're rejecting God because somebody cries when I pray for them? Or because wow. someone lies down yeah. on the floor and worship to God yeah. or because they heard a moving worship song or because yeah. somebody clapped because they were excited for the Lord. I mean, you see the criticism all the time. Like, okay, you're, you're singing too loud. You're dancing. You look like a fool. Well, well, no one thinks that's disorderly or out of place. Say, for example, when someone's celebrating like a family member coming home, we go, oh, look how sweet that <clears throat> moment is. Yes. But when I'm so moved by the goodness of God that I clap or I cry or I lift my hands, React is to that right. to be so strange to you? Yeah. No. That, that, I mean, how can you stand in the presence of God and not, and not be react? Yeah. Uh, when people talk about disorderliness, um, especially in this day and age, I actually often look back to Acts chapter 2. Uh. And I'm, I'm all for order, you know, excellence. But it happened in such a way that the outsiders had to say, they're drunk. <laughs> right. And I had yeah. to imagine how, how, what was actually happening because yeah. being drunk is not just in what you say, but also in how you act. So there was something the outsiders saw that made them believe these guys are actually drunk. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And people fall here and there into this church and, and people, you know, think that's disorder. And I go back to Acts chapter two again, like, yeah. There was such a powerful move that thousands of people had to say, these guys are drunk, not just because of what they said, but because of how they acted, because of what they did. And when, to me, we haven't even gotten to that point yet, and there is this pushback. Mm, I, I, right. I always look back to Acts chapter 2, like something ha- really happened there. Deshi, that's a great point. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. and, and think about this, what, what, when, when that, that, that scripture is quoted, let all things be done decently and in order, you know, or, or 
you'll see somebody crying and they'll say, that can't be God because he gives us <laughs> self-control. I'm thinking the fruit of self-control is a character trait that helps you to have mastery over self in terms of temptation and selfishness. Mm. It has nothing to do with reaction yeah. to something that is very real. Like nobody says, oh, you know, he accidentally touched an open socket, got electrocuted, moved his body, lost self-control. No, that yeah. is a reaction That's to something. Reaction. And we're not saying that we're, we're celebrating actual disorder. And we're not no. saying that, again, I want to emphasize that, right. not, not embracing right. weird for the sake of weird, but you have to question what they mean by order or what they think the scripture means by order. I think what they think when they say, let it be done in order, what they're actually saying is, let it be done according to my, my order. Standard. Mm -hmm. But sometimes yeah. God's order is disruptive to your order. Right. 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 And so if you're talking about let it be done decently and in order, that's according to God's standard. And he decides when and how that order, sh uh, how that order should look. I, I often think of Jesus's life and everything he's done and how strange some of these miracles were, right? Mm -hmm. I was literally reading right now in uh, John 9, 6, then he spit on the ground, made mud with saliva, yeah. and spread the mud all over the blind man's eyes. That's blind yeah. man's eyes. We know the story. Is that prescriptive or descriptive? <laughs> right. And that, that's what they'll do. They'll really want, okay, wait a minute. Did it really, do <laughs> Did it really happen? And I think of his life, and I think, my goodness, how, how strange are some of these things in the Bible? But this is our foundation. This is our root. And, you know, I was watching, a, I grew up watching a movie, The Prince of Egypt. I don't know if you guys have ever yes. heard of it. Great movie, cool movie as a child. It really gave me wonder. And I thought, okay, how odd is it that a bush would burn yeah. mm. and would tell him, tell him to go out and save his people? You know, if you've never seen the movie, go check it out. It's cool. But <laughs> it's one of the best secular takes on biblical, right, on right. biblical text. Yes. Uh, not completely accurate, like, like we said before, but it's, it's, it's pretty good. Yeah, it's great. It's, it's pretty great good. Movie. On the topic of Reviver, I think, you know, as, as this upcoming generation, we, we're very hungry, on fire. I think what um, I have seen quite often is um, there is a pushback, you know, we're disruptive, we're chaotic, disorder. And I've seen ministers and some people try to start to succumb to that. Like, yeah. Okay, maybe we need to add a little bit more rules on this end, on that end, um, in turn stifling the power of God. Um, which we were reading I Isaiah today as we we're driving down from Houston and the prophet Isaiah was prophesying about what would happen. Um, and I said to my wife, it took years for the Holy Spirit, or at least I think for the Holy Spirit to finally find someone to partner with him. Mm. How long will it take us mm. to stop saying, okay, the world is pushing back, this is happening. And finally I say, you know what, regardless of how it looks to mm -hmm. us, or to you, we will partner with the Holy Spirit. You call it disruptive. Mm. We don't see it as disruptive. This is according to the pattern of the Holy Spirit. This is according to the pattern of the scriptures. And I'm not, like you said, um, Pastor David, in, in no words, promoting disorderliness. But I think that there is this, you know, we don't like it. And okay, maybe we could adjust our route to fit yours. That, yeah. is, that is really starting to happen. Mm. Well, three, you know, three things I find happen when God shows up in unusual power. Number one, people get touched by the Holy Spirit. Yes, because again, we do not want to condone or celebrate disorder or weirdness for the sake of being weird. But at the same time, I do not want to stifle or quench the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I, want, I want him to be able to do whatever he wants, which is a scary thought, by the way, where Paul communicates to the church in Thessalonica, do not quench the Spirit. Mm. That tells me it's possible. So that's a little bit unsettling. But number one, people get touched by God. Number two, people will act in the flesh. What does that mean? Yeah. Often I find, not always, but often people who even acting in the flesh or manufacturing a certain response mm -hmm. um, to the Holy Spirit, often it is a genuine desire to connect with God and they don't quite know how to. Mm. And therefore they're trying to work themselves up into a frenzy. They need to be pastored. They need to be led. We don't need to shut down the activity of the Holy Spirit in the atmosphere because you have people who are being disruptive in the flesh. Discern. I actually feel right now like the Lord is encouraging us. Discern the disruption. Yeah. Number one, maybe it's somebody who's operating in the flesh because they are desperate to connect with God. Let's have some prayer people ready to minister to them. Maybe they're just maybe they are a disruptive person and they need to be taken out of the service. Mm. Let's do that. Or third, maybe it's a demon 
And, and people get really shocked. They're yeah. like, well, right. brother, we got to shut that meeting down because there'll be a demon manifesting there. And you know what I do? I celebrate. I celebrate if a demon is manifesting. Do you know what that tells me? Truly. If you are having meetings and demons are manifesting, mm-hmm. the level of Holy Spirit presence in that atmosphere is so intense that demonic spirits are uncomfortable. They have to go. And they have to go. Yeah. And you know what? Have a capable, competent prayer deliverance team ready to minister to those people, not to bring shame and not to bring focus, but to get them into a place where they can be ministered to. Why am I saying this? Because we have all of these concerns what happens if the Holy Spirit shows up? Yeah, that really is the question. What, okay, we believe in him in theory, mm-hmm. but what happens in practice if he shows up? Well, here's the reality. If he shows up, I want us to do everything possible to accommodate him because, David, at the end of the day, it's not about my preference. There mm-hmm. are certain things, I'll be honest, that when God moves certain ways, it's not my favorite thing. I think of my pastor, Pastor Norman, who saw an eight-year sustained visitation of the Holy Spirit at his wow. church in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. Oh. Brilliant man, got his doctorate of ministry. And he said, Larry, the laughing stuff. When people get touched <laughs> by Holy Spirit joy, right. and they start laughing. And he's like, the laughing stuff bothers Some me sometimes. Some people think it's creepy. Yes. Right. You know what he's, but, I, yeah. th- but this demonstrates maturity. He's like, yeah. he, he says, I don't like the laugh." but it's, I know it's God. Mm. What maturity, because, I'll, but I'll tell you this, like, cause sometimes it's a little bit bizarre. I remember right. being, I, I was in Blue Eye, Missouri with my friend, Tommy Evans, <laughs> ministering to people who were all over 70. It was a very mm. interesting, inter, one of the most interesting meetings we were ever in. And the Holy Spirit manifested with what we call holy laughter, joy, where all these people just started laughing. Yeah. And you know what happens though? They get touched by God. And when you get the microphone out to get the testimonies, your heart breaks and it's filled with joy Mm. because you start hearing these testimonies. Larry, I have not laughed since I lost my son. I have not had joy since I got divorced and my husband ran out on me. I have not experienced that. So I believe one touch of the joy of the Lord, like that we've seen it in meetings, can bring healing to anxiety, depression, that type of thing. But again, it doesn't come down to my preference. Like, is it a little bit strange, weird, different? Sure. But if it's God, if it's God, I don't want to stifle what the Holy yeah, Spirit's doing. A couple doing. of things yep, there. Yep. Some, somebody listening to that might say, or even observing that situation might say, what's the purpose of this? Yeah. This is fruitless. There's no point. But I often thought that that was such an arrogant position to take it's a big assumption on the part of an individual mm. saying something like that to look at a move of God like that and say, it's pointless what's happening. There's no oh. need for it. Well, sometimes it is just the overflow or if you will, and I don't mean this in the negative sense, but the symptom of what's actually happening, not the focus. Sure. And secondly, I want to really ground and define what we're talking about. We're kind of speaking in generalizations, you know, a little bit strange, a little bit disruptive to man's order, not God's order. Uh, a little bit, maybe some people are offended, a little bit outside yeah. the box. Okay, let, let's, let's, let's add actual descriptive language to this. We're talking about reactions to the presence and power of the Holy Spirit that are often misperceived. Yes. So as an example, my daughter walks into the kitchen the other day. The Encounter Podcast is sponsored in part by the partners and donors of David Hernandez Ministries. Your monthly gift or one-time donation enables us to reach the masses with the gospel of Jesus Christ through events and media. Join the movement and unite with thousands of believers around the world in supporting this growing effective evangelistic ministry. You can begin your partnership today for as little as $15 a month. Visit davidhernandezministries.com slash partner to become a monthly supporter or davidhernandezministries.com slash donate to give a one-time gift. Let's, let's add actual descriptive language to this. We're talking about reactions to the presence and power of the Holy Spirit that are often misperceived. Yeah, so yeah. as an example, my daughter walks into the kitchen the other day and I'm looking at her and Steve, you got three boys, so you know what this is. And this is just like, oh, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm looking at her and I just... I start laughing. Mm-hmm. I just was so, I was just, I just <laughs> laughed. It wasn't like, I wasn't like, ha ha, you know, like yeah, screaming yeah. my head off, but I was looking at her like a little chuckle came out 
And then the more I looked at her, just the more I laughed. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And and she looked at me. She's like, "Dad, why are you laughing?" <laughs> she's five, but she's sixteen. Yeah, yeah. She goes, "Dad, why are you laughing?" I go, "You just you 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 mm. make." I go, "You." I told her, "You make my heart smile." Mm. And she goes, "Okay." And she just walks away. You know. Yeah, yeah. So, but but then I realized in that moment, you know, it wasn't something I was trying to conjure. It wasn't something that oh. I was working up. You know, you get into the presence of the Holy Spirit, and I say get into the presence of the Holy Spirit. I don't mean that we can never leave. Psalm 139, seven, where can I escape mm-hmm. from yep. your presence? I'm talking about when you come into an awareness of the Holy Spirit's Holy presence, Spirit's yes. presence. And there's that manifestation. I like to say that the omnipresence of God is God's awareness of everything. Mm-hmm. The manifested presence of God is your awareness, awareness of him. Of That's good. Mm-hmm. And so yep. in those yep. moments, you become aware of him and everything in you was designed to, to respond, respond to God. Yep. Right. Yes. So my spirit responds to God. My emotions respond to God. Yes. My physical Body. being responds to God. You look all throughout the Old and New Testament, and you see in many instances that there was a temporary physical reaction in the physical body whenever the presence of God was manifested. Now, again, this isn't to say that it's always going to happen exactly like that or that if you don't feel something, you're not experiencing God. This is simply to say that when we invite the Holy Spirit to move as he moves, mm-hmm. he does what he wants to do. I've prayed right. for total strangers on the street who gets slain in the spirit and yeah. cuss at me. What the blank was that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm serious. Yeah. I'm serious. You, you, you know I've, I've this. Seen it. Yeah. He's seen it and, and, and they're going, what is this? Mm-hmm. I'm saying that's the power of God. I've prayed for people who've grown up in church, never saw anything like that, never experienced anything like that. They don't know I'm what you would call a charismatic Christian. Pray for them and yeah. suddenly they feel, they go, I, they're like, they start shaking. They're going, why am I shaking? I said, that's the power of God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, it doesn't always happen that way, but sometimes it does. And so now take things like the emotions. I mean, on the opposite end of the spectrum, certain individuals would be perfectly happy to say that God ignites the intellect. He illuminates mm. the mind to receive revelation of the word and rightly divide the scripture. Okay, yes. Yes. Yes and amen to that. Yep. But the same God who gave us intellect also gave us emotion. Right. Yeah. So what if I am so moved by the presence of God that tears begin to stream down my face? Sure. So what if I'm so happy to be in his presence just thinking about him mm. that there's great joy? And I think that some people are afraid of those kinds of emotions because A, they're not experiencing them themselves. Mm. And then B, we also understand, as you said, that some people can take those a little bit too far. It's possible that somebody's having a genuine encounter with God, wherein they're being moved emotionally, and then they allow themselves to become overhyped beyond what Mm. God intended. And so it can very well be fundamentally a genuine move of the Holy Spirit. And then superficially, they kind of ruin the testimony of it right, by right. the overreaction. But mm. that doesn't mean that we we reject the premise in the first place that the presence of God can cause something to happen. Yeah, yeah. No, it's true. And I think what's absolutely vital is I always say, you know, Peter did not shut down the day of Pentecost. I mean, this mm-hmm. is funny, but because in Acts chapter two, we see that there were those who mocked it says, some were amazed, some were confused, some were perplexed, and then at the end, some mocked them, accusing them of being drunk. I am grateful, again, that Peter did not oh, shut God, down right. the outpouring yeah. of the Holy Spirit because you had a few vocal people who mocked them. doesn't mean everybody completely understood what was happening, um, but I am very grateful that he stood up in the midst of it, gave a biblical context, and welcomed, obviously, what the Spirit of God was doing in that environment. So I believe, but I believe that's so necessary for the days that we're entering into. Mm. Okay, Larry, I went on to my YouTube community page. Yes. And before the interview, I posted some of these. So, uh, or I posted a question and then I received some of these responses. So uh, this is for everyone at the table, okay? Okay. Um, Well, this first one will go to Larry because he's probably the only one of us. I don't even know how to answer this one, (laughs) but you're going to probably be the only one of us who knows how to answer this. So you ready? So Fly Honey Bree says, I heard about a revival in a small town somewhere in Europe Mm. where the spirit of God fell so strongly on that town that people had to pull over on the freeway, kneeling and weeping in repentance. And all the bars went out of business. Can we talk about that kind of prayer community? Do you know that Mm. revival? Well, now, number one, I don't know every single revival. Or maybe she's thinking of another one. But there are some where that phenomenon took place. For example, the late 1950s, 40s, you had the Hebrides revival. And that was actually an evangelical revival. These, A lot of these revival were not, quote unquote, charismatic Pentecostal. Mm-hmm. But when you study the Hebrides revival with minister Duncan Campbell, 
this whole area, these islands off the coast of Scotland experienced such a visitation of God that literally the whole territory was saturated with an awareness of the presence of God. So much so, people would come out of their homes at night gathering together. The church would have services until like one and two in the morning, wow. not because we need to have additional services to fill up our schedule out of demand. They actually talked about how people would literally line up at the jail under conviction mm. of the Holy Spirit. Now, the bars being shut down, that speaks of what God did in the Welsh revival, 1904 with right. Evan Roberts. 100,000 were brought into the kingdom in a year, more or less. 100,000 people got, wow. got gloriously born again. And some of the things that happened societally in terms of transformation, you had bars being closed down. Mm -hmm. You had sinful entertainment being completely shut down. Mm. They even had to retrain the animals, interestingly enough, because the animals understood profanity. Wow. Get, wow. get that? Wow. The, an, the animals responded to curse <laughs> words something. because the people who had the mules and stuff would yell at them and use all sorts of foul language. The animals did not know what to do because the people literally, as a result of that revival, their language changed. <laughs> Society so was awesome. so impact. So, wow. so I think she is pointing to that kind of a move of God. That's incredible. That's crazy. Okay, this one's for the whole table. You ready? Emily Duncan dash toll HN asks a very simple question. What is revival? Mm. Mm. And I'll add to that in terms of biblical description. Yes. Wow. Okay. You want to you wanna go first? <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> I'll go back to Acts chapter 2. Um, I think we can try to define revival in different ways, but to me, it's the move of the Spirit that causes massive salvation of souls. Mm, mm. I think God's heart beats for souls every single day. So if there is anything he wants to use us for, it's for that. So when there is that mighty outpouring, it's to empower, enable us to bring souls into the kingdom of God. That's, that's my biblical definition of revival. Because mm. we see it in Acts chapter 2. Yeah. Yes, the Holy Spirit came, but it wasn't healing that came first. It wasn't the deliverance that came first. It was the 3,000 yeah. that had to come first and everything else followed. You know, I'll read a scripture that, that for me sums it up in uh, Matthew 15, verse 29. Jesus tells many, Jesus returned to the Sea of Galilee and climbed a hill and sat down. Mm. A vast crowd brought to him people who were lame, blind, crippled, those who couldn't speak, and many others. They laid them before Jesus, and he healed them all. Mm. Oh. The crowd was amazed. Those who hadn't been able to speak were talking. Mm. The crippled were made well, the lame were walking, and the blind could see again. Mm. And they praised the God of Israel. Uh -huh. Revival to me is when you have an encounter personally, and you take part in something like this, where the masses see the glory of God mm. and people are healed, there's faith, there's joy. I mean, you can't deny that these people definitely in the crowd doubted. Yeah. But I think, you know, when they look to Jesus and when he did all these things, I mean, my goodness, that just screams victory for mm. us. Yeah. And so revival to me, scripturally speaking, I mean, look at this right here. This is, they're in revival, blind eyes, literal blind eyes, People that couldn't walk are walking. I mean, I would be in an uproar. I'd be weeping and jumping just like these guys. So, yeah, incredible. I, I, I struggle with the term because we know the term itself is not in Scripture. Correct. But the principle behind yeah. the term is. And then because so many define it so many different ways, it's hard to lock down and say this is the biblical example of it. You know, it's not like we have this one working definition where we all agree. To me, it's almost like this, this gradient mm -hmm. as opposed mm -hmm. to a distinct line. Mm -hmm. And then I start asking myself questions. And this could be an overanalysis, but I start asking myself questions like, okay, is now 10 getting saved? I mean, that's people getting saved. That's wonderful. Yeah. But is it as modern Pentecostalism or the charismatic movement might define it as actual revival? At what mm -hmm. point do you get to that? So if I were to break it down simply for the individual level, it would be simply when you come into this place of renewed passion for the yeah. Lord. Yeah. Now, yeah. again, 
there's many different working definitions because the term is not found in scripture, but the principles that are often used as descriptives of that term are. Yeah, I, I would agree. I would actually agree with all of the different descriptions here. This is what I would share, kind of putting on my theological hat, is we need to be very careful about how we define terminology because yeah. I think if everything is revival, then nothing is revival. Yeah, mm. that's very And good. I think one of that's the... Good disadvantages of the 1900s is the beginning of the century. We had 1904 with the Welsh revival, right. 1906, the Azusa Street revival. But then what happened in church culture is we started to call two-week evangelistic oh, campaigns mm, revival revivals. meetings. And we still have a little bit of that wow. lingering left over. That's it's deep. like, well, brother, we're going to have a revival. And I'm not against that. You know why? People got saved. Right. That salvation, not revival. Yeah. I would dare say, well, I went to this meeting and I got touched by the Holy Spirit and he just did a wonderful, powerful work in my heart. I would say that might be a refreshing or renewal, mm. maybe not revival. So let mm. me give you my very clear analysis on this. You've got number one, a renewal, where I believe somebody who already is hungry for God, already yeah. burning for Jesus goes and they get touched radically by the Holy Spirit mm. and they become a Heidi Baker who's sent off to Mozambique or a Leif right. Hetland who's sent off to like Middle East. Like that was taking place when the Toronto blessing of 1994 was I believe in a renewal stage yeah. where people were going and that refreshing touch of the Holy Spirit changed their lives, mm. okay? So that's a renewal. We see that often in our meetings where a believer, I'll say it one more time, a believer in Jesus who already is burned burning for him, gets a significant touch of the Holy Spirit. But revival to me implies something was dead. Revival implies right, right. something was dry. It, it implies either individually mm. or for a corporate local church. It's like, man, we were just dead in religion. Mm. We were going through the motions. There was no zeal. There was mm, no yeah. hunger. There no was passion. no thirst. Yes, there's no passion for Jesus. Mm. We were dead and then God stepped in. Mm. Like to me, that speaks of revival personally in your own yeah. life or even again, Brownsville 1995, they called it the Brownsville Revival Bible. because of a local church that was kind of like John Kilpatrick, who's the pastor, had said, listen, we were successful. I had a lot of people who liked me. They were a mega church at the time, but he's like, I would feel so dry and dead. Wow. And he would go in the church at like one, two in the morning, just him, lay out on the pew and cry out, God, there's got mm. to be more. Mm -hmm. That was a revival, the Brownsville Revival. But then I think where we're moving into prophetically is awakening. Mm, wow. So you got renewal, revival, wow. awakening. awakening. I sense David even right now in the nations, mm. we are seeing the stirrings of awakening. And people might ask, Larry, what's the difference? Revival is an individual or a local church. But when I think of awakening, I do think of what happened in Wales because notice it was called the Welsh Revival. It wasn't called the Moriah Chapel Revival. Right. Mm. Moriah Chapel is really where that Welsh Revival started. It was, it was named after a territory. And I like to say awakening is when revival goes territorial, hmm. when we wow. actually start seeing regions of the earth impacted by the move of God. I mean, the, the New England awakenings of Jonathan Edwards and Finney and all those people, they experienced true awakening where it was not restrained or confined to one local church. Mm -hmm. We saw territories and geographies impacted by a move of God. So is it safe to say, at least in terms of the modern technology, not in technology, the modern, is it safe to say that in terms of how we define it as a movement, that we start with the very basic working definition of a move of the Holy Spirit, people getting saved, yes. healed, delivered. That is biblical. Yes. And the terms that we use are just a description of how many people are being affected by this at once. Mm. Yes. Yeah. So whereas revival, you say that's a little more personal or local. Yes. And then there's renewal, which kind of expands a little more. Which is definitely more. personal. But that, again, oh, that's... Oh, we started on renewal. We started with renewal. renewal. Okay, we're, renewal. Where people who are already burning for Jesus get a real fresh touch of the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit. Okay, so it, start, so it starts with renewal, yes. which is more of the personal experience yes. of what is descri described in Scripture. Then it goes to a little bit more of a localized but yep. corporate yes. experience of what is being described in Scripture. We call that revival. Yep. And then as it begins to affect the larger geographies, we would call that awakening. Yep. Let, me, okay. let me just wow. read one verse so here, because as you were sharing just about what Jesus saw in the Gospels, mm. there's a verse that I have overlooked in the Bible a bazillion times, mm. 
and the Lord highlighted it, and it has burned into my spirits. Acts chapter 9, where a guy gets healed, Aeneas, and uh, verse 34, Peter says to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Mm. Get up and make your bed. Sounds like what I say to my daughter sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Get up and make your bed. And immediately he got up. Now, typically I stop there because that's pretty <clears throat> impressive. That kind of miracle, that kind of decree that releases a miracle. I usually stop there and just move on to the next section. But it was the next verse, David, that got me. Where right after this miracle, verse 35, it says this. So all who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the wow. Lord. Mm. Wow. Mm. If that's in the book, mm. that's in the scripture, mm. that tells yeah. me I believe it's possible today because of a notable miracle. Just imagine it, David, in one of your meetings where somebody gets mm. healed in a notable way because that's happening. And as a result of that, and this is what I'm contending for, territories. Territories turn to the Lord because of a notable miracle like that. Why not? And Why we not? are seeing growth in the church. Yeah. This is what I'm so encouraged by. I mean, we're seeing it in our ministry and a lot of the people I'm friends with, a lot of my friends who are pastors and evangelists, yourself included, yeah, yeah. I'm getting reports from all around the world yeah. that there is just, as we would describe, this groundswell yeah. mm. of people being A, swept into the kingdom and B, Christians coming into the realization of the power of the Holy yes. Spirit. And, you know, I understand we have to address... To some degree, it's, it's necessary to address some of the, the remnants of these leftovers of what we would sure. call cessationism. But cessationism, for all intents and purposes, at least the doctrine itself, that the movement itself, it's, it's a dying movement. It's on mm. its way out. And again, that's not an attack on fellow believers. That's, no. again, that's, that's talking about a doctrine. I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about the doctrine, Correct. that belief system. So, you know, there's not much work that has to be done there anymore. Maybe, as I said, deal with some of the remnants. So it kind of stays on trend yeah. uh, in the way it's trending now. But in terms of what we're seeing, I'm so encouraged because nothing is going to stop this. No. Mm. Nothing can stop this, which is why I'll direct this. We'll take one more question from the, the community. And this one I'm going to direct right at you, Larry. This is coming from Reshmi Lorduraj dash KV seven I E. And they ask, can you explain the end time revival? I can, I can. So we have this wonderful end time promise. I mean, Acts chapter 2, Joel 2, we've been citing that portion of Scripture quite yeah, a bit. Right. I would say the quote-unquote end time revival is what God himself said for us to expect about the last days. Because yeah. as we all know, there's a lot of interest and intrigue, curiosity and confusion about this thing called the last days, yeah, right, the right, end right, times. Right. And as a publisher, I can tell you this. If I do a book, The 21 Signs That Jesus Is Coming Back Next Year, or if I do something about The 30 Signals of Apocalyptic Doom, those will be bestsellers. I am being slightly <laughs> facetious, but not entirely, because people are very curious about the apocalyptic darkness side mm. of the end times, the Antichrist, one world government, all that kind of stuff. Now, here's the interesting thing. When it comes to what God declared about the last days, I tell people, go back to Joel 2 and then read Peter's mm. sermon in Acts 2. Because mm. Peter says in Acts 2, verse 17, I'd never quite read it this way. Speaking of the end time revival, Peter said, listen, it's spoken about by the prophet Joel that in the last days, God declares. So stop right there. It doesn't say in the last days, the latest YouTube prophet declares. Right, it doesn't right. say in the last days, the uh, latest prognosticator or New York Times bestselling author or a guy with charts and graphs, all that. And that's fine. Like, let's preach and let's talk and debate about the charts and graphs of the end times events and all that. Totally fine. But I want to know what does God himself say mm. about the last days, the end times? So it says in the last days, God declares, all right, pay attention. God declares what? I will pour out my spirit mm. on all flesh. Amen. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy. That's a whole other message mm. because there's so many 
parents right now yeah. who are crying out and believing for a son or daughter who's gone far from God. Mm. I actually believe their son and daughter is literally written right into God's end time prophecy because wow. what does it say about sons and daughters? You They'll prophesy. prophesy. And what do we see right now happening? God is going after the sons and daughters. Mm -hmm. We see in an unstoppable move of the Spirit, even right now as we record this podcast, in these secular universities where thousands are showing up and they're not preaching in some watered down gospel. Mm. These students, Gen Z, are being radically impacted. They're getting saved. They're rededicating their lives to Jesus. They're getting water baptized in troughs, horse troughs <laughs> outside of the universities wow. or, or university fountains. Like at FSU, the number two party school in America, they actually were getting the students baptized, water baptized in the fountain. So it tells me God is coming after the sons and daughters in a glorious mm. way. But I believe when it comes to end time revival, yes, there are going to be days of darkness. Yes, there's going to be chaos, crisis, calamity. I don't want us to be ignorant of that. In fact, I'm not saying don't listen to people who have charts and graphs and teaching about that kind of stuff. But when it comes to what we build our lives on, when it comes to how we pray, when it comes to even what we're looking for, I want to be mm. darkness aware I don't want to be darkness preoccupied. Wow. I want to be aware of darkness. I want to be aware of what the devil is doing because Paul made it very clear. We, he, he didn't want us to be outwitted or outsmarted by the devices of the enemy. Yeah. I want to be aware of what the enemy is doing, but I'll tell you this, guys. I want to be a watchman of revival. Mm -hmm. I want to watch where the Holy Spirit is moving and do whatever I, whatever I can to throw myself into that. So end times revival is right there in Joel 2, Acts 2, in the last days. I believe, I'll say this, leading up to the second coming of Jesus, I believe he is coming back for a church in revival. Mm -hmm. He is coming back for a church maybe that would even outshine the book of Acts, outshine wow. the church there. I remember John Bevere saying this, that the Lord spoke to him and said, that church, the church that would be Jesus's end time church would make the book of Acts look like child's play. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't that, wouldn't that be like Jesus though? He's coming back for a church that is truly glorious, mm -hmm. demonstrating his glory. With that, I'll leave you with a question for conversation. How would you define revival? Tell me in the comment section. And until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God.